So open your Bible to Daniel, chapter number 11. We're going to hopefully get uh, up to and through verse 20 now and finish uh, that, uh, that part of this. And by that part of this, I mean the prophecy that extends from Alexander the Great's death and the, the, the division of his empire, easy for me to say, and then the, to the establishment of the estate out of which Little Horn will rise. So that's the work we're going to be doing this morning. Amen. We're looking at that period that leads from Alexander's death, the division of his empire, to the establishment of the estate out of which little horn or man of sin will rise to power. And what's interesting about Daniel's prophecy is that he skips over from the beginning of the fourth kingdom. He skips over that all the way to the end of it. Now, you've heard me bring this observation out time and again, today you'll begin to appreciate the significance uh, of that. We pointed out that God identified the first king of the first kingdom, the first king of the second kingdom, the, the first king of the third kingdom, but he only talks about the last king of the fourth kingdom. So he skips over all the history of the fourth kingdom and focuses only at, at its end rather than at its beginning. Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 11 does the exact same thing. It skips over the fourth kingdom, at least all the way to the end of it. He takes us right up through close to the end of the third kingdom and then skips over and talks about the last king of that kingdom. The estate to the rise of Antichrist from 164 B.C. all the way to we don't know when. When the end of the fourth kingdom will come. But he skips over all of that history that you're seeing indicated on the, on the chart there. All right? From toward the conclusion of the third kingdom, he skips over to the conclusion of the fourth kingdom. It isn't even the case that he goes to the end of the third kingdom. And from therefore, you would think it seems illogical in some ways, but it's not. It makes perfect sense. Especially, and one of the, one of the things that is important to understand here <laughs> is that from God's perspective, the movement from the third kingdom into the fourth kingdom is mysterious. He does that on purpose. It's secret. There's a secret behind it. There's a, there's a secret in God's heart that causes this strange thing in the prophecy. You would think it'd be so clean. Boy, it's so clear so far. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, Cyrus, Persia, the horn, the first king, etc. Very clearly described, but not identified by name. But still, very clearly described, first king of third kingdom. You get to the fourth kingdom, it's all messy. There's no clear ending of the third kingdom. There's no clear beginning for the fourth clear, uh, kingdom. It's, it's just vague. It's like it's, it's as almost as if there's some kind of a, a, a veil put over that little section and it's fuzzy. And then you get to the end of the fourth kingdom. It's all clear again. The prophecy speaks with great clarity and specificity. But that period from conclusion of third to beginning of fourth is very, very fuzzy. And that's because of a secret that God had. Now, you and I know that during the fourth kingdom, the churches are on the earth holding the keys of the kingdom. What that means begins to become more and more clear as we continue in our study together here. Um, and there is certainly a convergence in, in what we've been talking about for a while now, about the dominion and all that stuff. There's a convergence of all these things because... This whole thing with Babylon, Persia, it's all about the dominion going from one to the next to the next. And that's what it's about. But you come to this end of third, beginning of fourth, it gets real fuzzy because there's a secret there. And when the secret's revealed, this begins to get more clear when you know the secret. So what is this secret? Of course, we know the church is going to be uh, lifted, uh, taken out of the earth, and then the Antichrist will come. Let me go ahead and get over here to the secret now. All right, the secret. What is it? Well, first of all, let's establish that there is one. All right? 
Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now the word mystery means secret. We tend to think of the word mystery as being somehow associated to something magical. That's a mistake. That's a pagan idea and a pagan understanding of the word mystery. <clears throat> when we talk about the word mystery, we mean secret. Of course, pagans use it that way too. But anyway, according to the revelation, now the word revelation means, well, you know, revelation. Something revealed, something shown, something presented, something exposed, something declared, something revealed. According to the revelation of the secret or mystery. And this secret or mystery was kept secret since the world began. So from the foundation of the world, a secret was formed and then kept in God's heart for all that time until the revelation of the mystery, which happened in our day. By our day, I mean beginning with the entrance of Christ into the world. That's the beginning of the revelation of the mystery or the secret. So Romans 16 verse 25 tells us that there is something called the mystery. There's a secret that's been kept in the heart of God all this time. What other event can you think of that occurred in God's mind or in God's heart from the foundation of the world? The cross. Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There's a relationship, there's a connection between these two things. The lamb, remember, John the Baptist declared Jesus Christ by saying, Behold, the what? The Lamb of God. So this Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world was declared to have arrived by John the Baptist. And this secret that was kept from the foundation of the world is being revealed at that time. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so there is a secret and it was revealed to the church. And what is the secret? Here it is. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now the great mystery he's talking about in Ephesians 5 is the, is the union between the man and the woman to become one and all this. And the man's the head of the woman as Christ is the head of the church. And the woman is to Christ what, is, what the church is to the, the woman is to the man, etc. You got it. Good. <laughs> so that's the mystery and so and that's Christ and his church so marriage is really a picture of Christ and the church not the other way around see in any event the point being that back in that beginning of the world era Jesus Christ was determined to be and committed by God to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world and a secret was formed in his heart at that moment and that secret that he treasured in his heart was the union between his son and the church. Wow. That was the secret. All right. The mystery of the seven stars. Remember Revelation uh, 1 verse 19 and 20 here. Uh, Jesus Christ is presented at the end of the Bible as standing in the midst of the churches. The seven golden candlesticks which represent the churches. And so verse 19 says, refers to it as the mystery. This word mystery. Mystery, mystery, mystery. The mystery that was kept in God's heart from the foundation of the world and revealed to us when Christ was presented, when Christ came into the world. And that mystery is Christ and the church. That's what the mystery is, the secret that was kept. He kept that a secret. What he's keeping secret is Christ coming into the world in flesh and redeeming to himself a people that would be joined to him as his church. That was the secret. And so in the, at the end of the Bible, we read about this mystery, the secret of the seven stars and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. It's about the church, you say. And the seven golden, and, I'm sorry, and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So this mystery is about the churches. It's the mystery of Christ in us opposing the mystery of iniquity in the world. Okay? 
to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that's the mystery, Christ in us. You begin to see how this all comes together. Colossians 1, verse 27. Opposing the mystery of iniquity, which is in the world right now. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now the word letteth, the word letteth, in, uh, in Old English, really not so much Old English, more like Middle English, I guess they'd call it. Uh, anyway, in the 1800s, in that era, in that time, that word let means to restrain or to hold. And so the idea is what withholdeth will withhold. Or what uh, the agency present that is now restraining the mystery of iniquity will continue to restrain the mystery of iniquity until that's taken out of the way. When that's taken out of the way, then the mystery of iniquity will be let loose. But right now, it's being held back. It's being restrained. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse number 7. So the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of iniquity is the spirit of Antichrist. The mystery of, of Christ is Christ in us, the hope of glory. The mystery of iniquity is the spirit of Antichrist working in the children of disobedience to bring about the rise of the Antichrist, the person we call Antichrist, the rise of the man of sin. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. It's a fascinating insight in that passage. First, notice the spirit of Antichrist refuses to accept the spirit of Jesus Christ and the truth that Jesus Christ has come into the world. That's the mystery. That's the secret. The secret in God's heart was, I'm going to send my son into the world to become flesh. In flesh, he will die upon the cross to redeem for himself a people out of the world who will be gathered together and be his church. And that will be the bride of Christ and they will come together and be one and go on into eternity. This is the secret that God kept in his heart way back from the very beginning. So when Christ came into the world, John the Baptist declared, Behold the Lamb of God, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Behold, here he is. And the whole point is that Christ who is the second person of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Christ is the second person. The second person of the Godhead would become flesh. And there's a denial on the part of the Antichrist world that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. The significance, remember, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is huge because what it essentially means is that Jesus can rule the dominion directly. The dominion was given to man. And so, uh, devils and even angels had to work through men in order to get things done. They still do on the dark side. And, it, and God does too. The difference is this though. Now, God works among his churches. <laughs> Begin to see this. The reason that period, the transition from third to fourth, that whole period is so hard to see in prophecy is because God on purpose kept it secret. He put a shroud of secrecy around it. We only understand it when we are accepting the mystery revealed to us through the word of God. He reveals to us these things, and that's what I've been giving. I've just been handing it to you, but now I'm kind of showing you a little more deeply where this is coming from and how this comes out of Scripture, all right? The fact is, the reason I call the fourth kingdom mystery is because that's the nearest thing you'll find in the Bible to describe it. 
It's mystery. It's about mystery. It's about the mystery of Christ in us and the mystery of iniquity in the world and the clash between those spirits and the war that's ongoing. That's what the fourth kingdom right now is all about. So it's called mystery. And it's fuzzy in there because God kept it secret so the devil could not know when the fourth kingdom was going to start. Nobody could know when the fourth kingdom was going to start. He didn't let that out of the bag. He didn't define a ruler by which we can mark the beginning of the fourth kingdom unless you point to Antichrist. But we know he shows up at the end of the fourth kingdom, not at the beginning. Interesting, isn't it? What God kept secret was this. He was going to send his son into the world. His son would come into the world and come in flesh. And being the son of God, he would conquer Satan and take all the kingdoms of the world into his own power. And being the son of man, he would take the dominion from Adam's race to himself. So now, the fourth kingdom, as it's constituted right now, is organized under Christ Jesus. And the keys of that kingdom are given to his churches. And we have the authority. Now, where it gets a little strange is trying to figure out how does that, what does that mean in terms of practicality? I mean, does that mean that, <laughs> that we, we go over to the White House, say, move out, we're going to move in. We go to Capitol Hill, move out, we're moving in. No, because we don't take the kingdom by force. It's ours, but we don't take it by force. We take it upon the declaration of God's word and God's truth. We use the sword of the Spirit. We fight against the lies of Satan. We try to expose men to the truth, and they have the chance to accept it or reject it. So right now, what Jesus has done, he's risen from the dead, and he has said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. It's all mine. And here's what we're going to do. You go out and spread the word. These are my terms of surrender. Send out the word. Tell everybody the terms of surrender. All who surrender will be saved from the wrath that's coming. Those who refuse to surrender will be judged when I return. And that's what the situation is right now. So men have a choice. If men choose to submit to Jesus Christ, he will bless them. He will give them the kingdom. Any nation that brings forth the fruit of the kingdom is given heaven's favored nation status. And blessed. Blessed is that nation whose people or that people whose God is the Lord. And they're exalted in the earth. And if such a nation forgets God, turns his back, then God will bring them down. Just as he did in the Old Testament, he still does that today. Same thing's going on. Only Jesus Christ now, being son of man, son of God, has it in his power. So we are living in the time of the mystery. So all that history is skipped over by Daniel. And now you understand why. That's why Daniel's prophecies, interestingly, are organized this way. He, he, goes, he goes first kingdom, first king, first kingdom, second king, first king of the second kingdom, first king of the third kingdom. All blurry. Real focused on the end, but no detail given from its beginning. No way to know how it begins. So we come to the New Testament and we see how it begins. And it actually begins with Jesus Christ coming into the world. That's actually when this whole thing begins. And a big fight goes on now between Satan and, and God and God's angels and Satan's people and God's people. Big wars going on. And how we fight that war will be talked about a little bit in the message this morning and, and tonight. But anyway, there are some hints about this in the Old Testament. Isaiah 6 gives a hint of a time where the Gentiles would be brought in. Uh, Isaiah 28, 11 to 15 gives some hint about this period. Hosea 3, where the prophet's told to marry uh, a Gentile woman that's a harlot to, to make her his wife. That's, a, that's symbolic <coughs> of, of Christ reaching out to the Gentiles and making them his bride. So there are some hints to this period in the Old Testament, but it's fuzzy and vague until you get to the revelation of the mystery when we have the revelation of the mystery then we can look back on that and go oh look at there oh oh the queen in gold of Ophir oh look we can see it all over the place 
when we take the New Testament flashlight and turn it on the Old Testament, we can see all kinds of stuff there that we couldn't see on the other side of the cross. Amen. All right. So now that you have a little better, a little deeper appreciation, understanding of that, we're looking at Daniel's prophecy of the history that extends from Daniel 8 and goes on to the end. And it's talking about the uh, division of Alexander's kingdom into four kingdoms. And it narrows its focus down to only two of them. The southern kingdom, which is the green section toward the bottom of the map you see on the screen. And then the, and I don't know what that color is. Can someone tell me? Reddish brown? <coughs> we'll call it rose. That's a good name for it. Yes, rose. Very good. The rose colored section there is the Seleucid Empire called in the Bible the northern kingdom. So when you're reading through Daniel and you read the king of the north, it's a king of that section up there. When you king, read king of the south, it's a king of that section down there. Is that vague enough for you? It gives you some sense, hopefully, of what's going on there. Let's go ahead and get through this. Daniel 11, 15 to 16. Now, we've worked our way pretty carefully from verses 5 through verse 14. If we're going to reach back to verse 14. We've got to pick up something there. and We'll do that in a moment. But verse 15 begins with the word so. And the word so tells us that what follows describes the manner in which this king of the north will fulfill the prophecy of verse 14. All right? The manner in which the prophecy of verse 14 is fulfilled. Look at verse 14. The Bible says, And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. And the king of the south refers to Egypt, very good, king of the south. Also, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fail. What vision? Now, we already talked about this. This is review right here, but I want to make sure you're, you've got that in mind as we go forward. Verse 14 is a prophecy that says that many are going to stand up against the king of the south at this time in the history of the prophecy, and at this time, robbers of your people will exalt themselves to establish the vision. And they're going to fail. Now, what is the vision? That's a reference to Daniel chapter 8. That refers back to Daniel 8. It talks about the rise of Little Horn. The commission of something called the abomination of desolation or the abomination that make it desolate. The transgression of desolation. There are what this prophecy says is there are going to be some people in the in the southern kingdom who are going to rob your treasures, and they're going to try to establish the vision. But they're going to fail in doing that. So the point is the word so in verse fifteen indicates to us that what follows describes how that prophecy is fulfilled. That's what's important about the word so in verse 15. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Or in other words, the king of the north who fulfills this prophecy in verse 14 is going to be very strong. He's going to attack the south. The south cannot stand up against him. That's, in summary, what it's saying there. Verse 16 begins with a term of contradiction. But, and that indicates that instead of the king of the south being able to withstand, in other words, he will not be able to withstand, but instead of that, here, this is the idea. All right? Uh, not because the king of the north will do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. Now, a colon follows the first clause. Now, I only go here when I think it's important to understand the development of thought in the passage. I mean, we could, there are insights to be had in following punctuation clearly all the way through it. But only when it's critical to what we need to, what we need to understand this will I stop and do a little fourth grade grammar with you, okay? Amen. <laughs> Joe is very grateful for that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, brother. The colon follows the first clause, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land. Daniel eleven sixteen. Now, what follows the colon then proceeds from the action described in the first clause. I hope that makes sense to you. 
All right? So what follows the colon describes action that's, that's or, or proceeds, excuse me, <laughs> from action described in the first clause. I tried to clarify it, and I made it more muddy. <sighs> Sometimes it's better leave it alone. But anyway, tell me you follow, you're following this so far so I can continue with it. Okay, good, thank you. Four of us, we got it. This means that his standing in the glorious land and setting his hand against it to consume it, that's what he did as part of his campaign against the king of the south. That becomes important to us in a moment, but that's why following that language and being careful about the colons and things is important. It helps you, helps you sort this out correctly. So the point here is that this king who fulfills the prophecy of verse 14 is going to go about doing it in this way. He's going to want to attack Egypt. His interest in attacking Egypt is going to motivate him to take a stand in the glorious land and set his hand against it to consume it. And this, is, this he's going to do as really with an interest toward Egypt, trying to take out Egypt completely. Now this fits the history of Antiochus four epiphanies perfectly. All right, let's look at it. Antiochus 4. Now, he's the fellow most prophecy students know about. He's the guy that sacrificed a pig on the altar of the, of the Jewish temple. He's the guy, so many people believe that was the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. He's the guy that called himself God. He called himself son of Zeus, like Alexander. He was trying to be Alexander, by the way. We'll see that more as we go. <clears throat> he called himself son of Zeus. He put a statue of Zeus in the holy place of the temple. And many people look at that and say, oh, that's the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Well, we got a lot of problems with that. The biggest problem we have with it is that Jesus comes along about 160 some odd years later and tells us that that event, the abomination of desolation, is yet future. So according to Jesus, what Antiochus did was not it. So what is it that Antiochus did? He tried to establish the vision, but he failed. That's in verse 14. That's where Antiochus comes in. He fulfilled the prophecy of verse 14, not the prophecy that comes in later, beginning at verse, about, about verse 30, 36. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. All right, 171 B.C. This king of the north, Antiochus IV, stood in the glorious land. The glorious land, by all accounts, is Jerusalem. He robbed the temple treasure. This is history, by the way. He robbed the temple treasure, which he used to finance his campaign against the king of Egypt. So it's interesting, you see, it fits the prophecy perfectly is the point I'm laboring to establish. It fits the prophecy, not sort of, not kind of, not, hmm, look how close, but dead on in terms of his motivation, in terms of his actions. Everything is there in the prophecy. Why he did it, what he did, it's all there. So he wanted to finance his campaign against Egypt. He wanted to get his hands on the treasure of the Jerusalem temple in order to finance it. So he said his, he took a stand in the glorious land and he robbed the temple treasure. Just exactly what the prophecy said that he would do. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. So he's going to, after he does that, he's going to set his face, see, to just conquer the whole world kind of thing. <laughs> and the Bible says he takes upright ones with him. Now we brought out a little bit of what that, that means, but we'll, we'll summarize it here. A certain sect of the Jews at that time were called Hellenizers, and another sect was called the Hasidic, or we call them today Hasidic Jews. The Hellenizers supported the kings of the north. The Hasidic Jews, or the Hasidic Jews, they really didn't align themselves with anyone, but they favored the kings of the south. The Hasidic Jews served as a kind of pushback against the spirit that was working in the northern kingdom 
to raise up the man of sin. What you see as you read this is Satan's trying to rise up or raise up the man of sin that he will use to rule the world. But he keeps getting checked. He keeps getting some pushback here. All right. <clears throat> now, these would not be called upright ones. By the way, the, uh, by, uh, uh, back up. The Hellenizers who sympathize with the uh, southern kingdom, I'm sorry, the northern kingdom, who wanted to kind of Greekify their society. They wanted to fold in and accommodate the Greek culture and all that. That's why they're called Hellenizers. So those people aren't the, the ones that this prophecy has in view, even though they would support the king of the south. I keep doing that, king of the north, even though they would support Antiochus. That's not who we're talking about. Why? Because the Bible refers to them as upright ones. And there isn't any Jew worth his salt that would refer to a Hellenizer as an upright one. <laughs> Wouldn't happen. Not only the Holy Spirit would refer to them as upright ones. It's clear Antiochus pressed upright ones into his service, and that was a practice in that day, and we talked about that. In fact, that's been a practice in war throughout. So just that's, that's enough of that for now. The daughter of women. He's going to give the daughter of women. All right, verse number 17. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. So who is this daughter of women? Well, apparently, in a manner similar to how Ptolemy II earlier, you might remember, gave his daughter, Berenice, to Seleucus. Remember that history? We talked about it before. Apparently, Antiochus IV gave to Ptolemy VI the daughter of women. Now, here's where this gets a little bit muddy because history tells us that Cleopatra, the daughter of Antiochus the Great. Now, Antiochus the Great happened to be the father of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Are you following this okay? Why, you know, it, it's probably a good thing my dad didn't name me after him. It just creates confusion. <laughs> but anyway, um, so Antiochus the Third, also known as Antiochus the Great, had a son. His name Antiochus the Fourth. Actually, his name was Mithridates or something like that. And he took the name Antiochus when he conquered the kingdom. We already went over that history. I'm not going back over it right now. Anyway, his father presented Ptolemy V, Epiphanes, with a daughter. This is in history, by the way. Who was Cleopatra? So Cleopatra, you see, was sister to Antiochus IV. And so some people see that in this prophecy. But it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the prophecy. It's a historical anecdote that historians, secular historians, make a big deal about. They make a big deal about this. And so prophecy students often make the mistake of seeing that and then working it into the prophecies. We got to be careful about that. God probably wasn't as impressed with Cleopatra as they were. You know what I mean? So Cleopatra, as far as God's concerned, wasn't any big deal. I don't believe it, it works to try to force this prophecy to fit Cleopatra. I've done it myself just to, exp just to examine it, to say, okay, to test it. And so I've gone through it very carefully and tried to work through how this would happen. Uh, so maybe Antiochus III is the guy we're talking about here, not Antiochus IV. But the problem is Antiochus III didn't try to establish the vision. And we get, you know what I mean? I can't, I won't go farther than that. But just to say when I got done, I was both exhausted and convinced. Cleopatra is not the one in view here. The most that can be said for this anecdote is that obviously this was a regular practice. And we know it was. It wasn't unusual for a king who conquered another king as part of their negotiations to make peace to give one of his daughters to that king. <clears throat> they did that kind of thing all the time. And it didn't work very well. <clears throat> I mean, it often backfired on them. So anyway, apparently that's what happened here. Whoever this woman was, 
She was given to the king of the south by the king of the north in expectation that she would be on the side of the king of the north, kind of be a planted spy. <clears throat> However, according to the prophecy, this daughter of woman would betray the expectation of the king of the north and would not stand on his side. Neither would she act on his behalf, neither before him, it says. Now, we think that suggests that this wasn't a daughter. Remember when, uh, uh, when Berenice was given to Ptolemy back in the day, Berenice didn't um, forsake or betray her father. Other events happened that created a big mess out of that, remember? When I say it didn't work, I, you know, the truth is sometimes it did work, right? Sometimes it worked. Uh, the, it would cause that king to be loath to go to war against his wife's father. So it created a little bit of a check on that. And also there was a kind of a ob obvious and natural loyalty in the heart of that, that queen toward the father who was the king of the other kingdom. And there was always the expectation, the motivation to maintain that marriage because out of that marriage could come a child that could rule both kingdoms and combine them. So that was the idea of it. <clears throat> so anyway, my point here is that this suggests to me that this wasn't his daughter. It was, that's why it doesn't say, as it did earlier, one of his daughters, it's, it's talking about the daughter of women. So we don't know who that is. Who in the world is that? What's his daughter of women? Interestingly enough, uh, that expression is nowhere else used in the Bible, and we have to do a lot of work to figure it out. It's in my notes. You can go ahead and study that out and see. But I think it probably was uh, uh, a very beautiful woman that he took out of his kingdom and gave as a gift to this other king. I think that's probably what happened. You know. And it wasn't Cleopatra. Cleopatra didn't hold a candle to this girl. I'm just kidding around. I don't know. And anyway, verse, because this is the daughter of women. The Holy Spirit called her, this is the daughter of women. Woo, phew, big name. Anyway, verse 18, let's get over to that. Verse 18 opens with the word after this, the expression after this. After the king of the north places in the house of the king of the south what he supposes is a confidant who will support him, he then would move on to further his conquests. So he will turn his face to the isles. Let's look at that expression. This is an expression that most commentators believe refers to the outer regions beyond Palestine. It's used to speak of the shores of distant islands of Cyrus and Crete. I should have put a map up there so you could see this. My map's not up there anymore. But anyway, yeah, how many of you know where Cyprus is? Over there, but, but the foot of the boot there of Italy, you know, and the Crete's over here. Okay, so you know where those islands are. Many people believe it speaks to the shores of those distant islands. However, the expression is also used to speak of the habitable lands of the Gentiles in a more general way. Genesis 10.5, you'll see that. Specifically, Isaiah describes this expression, the isles, far off. He describes it as including Tarshish, Pole, Lud, Tubal, and Javan, or Javan. And he does that in Isaiah 66, verse 19. And these are together referred to in the Bible as the isles afar off. We think of isles as a mass of land completely circled by water. We think of an island. That's not necessarily how the word was used all the time, even in ancient history. They, they would use the word to speak of people far away. All right? And that's the way that's used in Isaiah 66, verse 19. Tarshish is identified as a place on the Mediterranean, and some would say that it is Spain. Pole is probably somewhere in Ethiopia. Lud is Lydia. Tubal is thought to be Iberia. So we've come around now, Iberia, and we're just across there from Spain. We've come back around to Spain. And then Javan, or Javan, is Greece. So those areas were referred to in the Bible as the Isles of Far Off. And it's used sometimes in Hebrew literature to refer to the, uh, the habitable parts of the earth outside of Israel. So in other words, everybody else. 
is kind of the way the word is used. The point is that this king of the north has vainly imagined that he's going to receive or revive, excuse me, the Alexandrian Empire. That's what's important about this part of the prophecy. It tells us that this king of the north has a vision for reviving, reestablishing, reconnecting all the kingdoms of the world in, into a revival of the Alexander uh, Empire. All that we know about the megalomaniac personality of Antiochus for Epiphanes in history makes it very easy to believe he would boast of such a vision of world dominion. In fact, he did. However, the Bible says, a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. So there's going to be this prince who, for reasons of his own and interests of his own, will cause the reproach that's offered by Antiochus IV, that's what I believe we're talking about here, to cease. That is, Antiochus IV is going to present a reproach upon a people, and a prince, on his own behalf, in his own interest, is going to stand up against him and stop him. Now, most think this refers to Laonis, the Roman general who rebuffed Antiochus as he sought to enter Egypt to finish off his conquest. So he has pillaged the temple. He hasn't, he hasn't set up the abomination of desolation yet. By the way, something I failed to make clear. Earlier I talked about him standing in the glorious land and pillaging the temple. He does that, but he doesn't at that time do all this other stuff and try to establish the vision. He gets his money. He deposes the priest. He puts his own priest in place, Heliodorus. And then he goes toward Egypt to finish it off. So he sent, his, he sent the daughter of women to him to kind of calm him down and distract him. He's got the money to finance his campaign. He's on his way to wipe out Egypt. So, and many think that this reproach was what Antiochus IV offered upon the Jews after he was humiliated by the Roman general Laodice, but that reproach was delivered. It did, it, it did not come back on him. He delivered that, re that reproach. So anyway, it doesn't fulfill the, po the prophecy. That's what I'm trying to say. So what happened in history is Antiochus is on his way to Egypt, and then Rome sends a general to meet him before he gets into Egypt. And this is that famous story where Laodice draws the circle around, I might be getting ahead of my notes, and that's going to mess me up, that draws a circle around Antiochus and says, you're going to leave Egypt alone. Stop right there. Make up your mind right now whether or not you're going to go, and we will fight you right now, or you're going to return back. And Antiochus says, well, actually what happened was that Laodice told him, you can't go any further. Stop here. You're not going to go into Egypt. I'll explain that in a minute. Antiochus says, okay, I'll take counsel with my generals and my officers. I'll give word back to you. And then Laodice took his sword and drew a circle around Antiochus, said, make up your mind before you step out of that circle. <laughs> so uh, Antiochus thought better of it and decided, well, we'll stop right here today. And, uh, but he went back. <clears throat> the Bible says, then he turned his eyes upon the isles. I'll explain that some more in just a moment. Many people believe this prophecy is what's, that this event is what's in view in this prophecy. I don't think it is. You see, there's another anecdote in the history of Epiphanes that could answer to this prophecy and that answers it perfectly, whereas this one just sort of gets close. How about we start right here next week? And we don't do any of the front load stuff. Okay, <laughs> promise you, we won't do any of the front load stuff. We'll start right here, the estate established. You with me? Let's stand together, please. That's what we'll do.